Good morning. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Sofal Ear with us. His research and teaching focuses on international political economy, security, and development, including how to rebuild countries after wars. He specializes in Southeast Asia and is a leading authority on Cambodia. He joined Occidental College in August 2014 after teaching political economy and post-conflict resolution at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School and a postdoc on international development policy at the Maxwell School um, at Syracuse University. He possesses a bachelor's from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's from Princeton, and a PhD from UC Berkeley. His recent books include Aid Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy from Colombia in 2013, and he's the co-author of The Hungry Dragon, How China's Resource Quest is Shaping the World, Rutledge 2013. Please join me in thanking Dr. Ear for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out here today to listen to this talk. I, um, I uh, was thinking about uh, all my fond memories at NPS. I don't know how many of you are NPS alums by chance. So a few of you, great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what the Belt Road means for democracy and talk about the case of Cambodia. And it's really, uh, it could be titled differently, I suppose, uh, or China and Southeast Asia from threat to charm offensive to threat again. In some ways, what uh, China represents for a lot of Southeast Asia is this idea that um, uh, they, they've come with resources, but they also want certain decisions to be made and they wanna take the South China Sea, for example. Um, but first, I wanna thank a few folks, uh, Professor Don uh, Murphy, Dean Chris Hammer, uh, the protocol uh, chief, uh, Cindy Hawkins, and so many others here, including yourselves, of course, for, for making it out here today. Um, uh, so uh, Don talked about my two books. I just wanna say briefly uh, a few words about them. Aid Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Ass Assistance Undermines Democracy is really about how foreign aid in a heavily uh, uh, aid-dependent country like Cambodia impacts that country's uh, decision-making and sometimes undermines democracy because the taxation that one would collect or the taxes that one would collect don't get collected because the aid substitutes for that. So the revenue that uh, taxpayers would give to the government as part of the compact of democracy is broken because uh, they then listen to other countries, to the donors, for example, and not to their own people. And The Hungry Dragon, How China's Resource Quest is Reshaping the World is about China in Angola, uh, Brazil, Cambodia, and elsewhere and how China essentially is uh, hungry for resources, but also causes those countries to change their, their policies in ways that may not always be helpful. So that's really sort of the theme of this talk that focused on Cambodia today. Uh, since it's April 15th, I'd be remiss in, in not uh, letting you know that we are very close to the 44th anniversary of the fall of Phnom Penh, which happened on April 17th, 1975. And that's, of course, a very significant uh, event. Uh, I'm originally from Cambodia. I, we survived the, the Khmer Rouge, escaped via Vietnam, and were refugees in France and came to the United States. It's a, a story I tell in a TED talk that you may uh, have come across. Um, but it is uh, the story of a country that you know, suffered 1.7 million deaths, a quarter of the population died, and uh, suffered communism, and under really Chinese influence in terms of one of the biggest supporters of the Khmer Rouge during that time. So history, perhaps um, not so far away. Uh, Don mentioned that I, uh, I, I'm at Occidental College these days. I came in in the uh, fall 2014 collection there. Um, they're a great, uh, it's a great college. You may know uh, one of its former students, uh, President Barack Obama, who, uh, who was, uh, we're proud to say, studied two years before moving on to Columbia University. Um, but um, before Oxy, uh, I was at the Naval Postgraduate School, and you know I taught students, junior versions of yourselves, junior military officers, uh, who had come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and who had been very good at uh, obviously uh, winning the war in terms of uh, uh, destroying the enemy, but also were now tasked with rebuilding the country, which was more difficult said than none. Uh, one of the first lessons I would teach was this idea that you know, building a country is not like 
building a house. You're not going to do a blueprint and go from the ground up. You're going to have to make changes along the way that the work of nation building or state building is far more like gardening as a matter of course. So in gardening, uh, the weather changes, the soil conditions are different, time to prune may be different. Locals know those things. Uh, so one of the first lessons, and I want to share this with you, is this illusion of control that in the military is very prevalent, this uh, idea that you have control. So gardeners have no illusion of control. We create the right growing conditions, nurture a healthy soil life, set up our lifestyle so we have time to tend our crops, uh, and we plant a diver diverse variety of sturdy, healthy plants and watch them grow. Uh, we adjust as we go along, removing excess weeds, mulching, watering, and fertilizing as necessary, and picking off pests. But ultimately, and this is a, re a really important lesson, the end results almost always include crop failures and unexpected successes. And we feel more like uh, stewards, sometimes even observers, than masters of our domain. And it's, it's certainly a lesson that has been repeated in the past. Uh, Major Joseph Brühl, uh, a few years ago, had a, a guest piece in Tom Ricks's blog on foreign policy. We need leaders who think like gardeners. And he says, you know, growing up, um, if I wasn't playing sports, I was uh, building model airplanes, gardening with my father. Uh, both were captivating exercises, but for different reasons. Building models was a drill in precision and attention to detail. Gardening was complex experiment in give and take. Of course, I talk as if I'm a world's best gardener. I really do this to my plants. Uh, so. Uh, Caveat Amtor, uh, now let's talk about the Belt Road and what it means for democracy. To provide some context, we know that under uh, uh, the previous administration, the presidential administration, there was a rebalance to Asia, and part of that was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It didn't pass. We exited that as one of the first acts of President Trump. Uh, so what would have been an economic uh, rebalancing in, in which uh, the United States would take part in a trade pact involving uh, so many of the countries of Asia uh, did not take place. But that pact continues as under a different name, just without the United States. But the economic considerations are huge for Asia. I mean, we're talking about 60% uh, of US trade with the Pacific region, uh, Asian maritime and regional security that are vital to US interests. Uh, and Asian Americans are 6% of the US population, but more importantly, are the fastest growing ethnic group. Asians dominate the vast number of foreign students in America. Uh, just look at the geoeconomic context for a second here. You've got Southeast Asia here. You've got a population numbering over 600 million. Uh, you have uh, billion, trillions in GDP and per capita uh, GDP of 3,558. This is still a few years ago. Uh, China by itself, of course, even larger, 1.3 billion people, uh, a higher per capita GDP, 10 trillion. Uh, there in overall GDP. And within the Southeast Asian context, these are uh, the countries of Southeast Asia in which ethnic Chinese hold, uh, have a hold on the economy. And you can see you've got Cambodia at 92%, the Philippines at 62%, huge numbers. Now, that doesn't mean they're listening to Beijing. It just means they're ethnic Chinese. And of course, there are going to be connections uh, to greater China in general as a result. Uh, so it's really China. It's, it's been China's game for some time now in Southeast Asia. Uh, if you look at the number of visits of uh, military exchanges of, of, uh, of generals uh, going to Beijing and uh, ch uh, ch generals coming to Cambodia, here you have a list. It's been very active since 2013 and even, even prior, but certainly more so than, than the U.S. has in the recent past been able to, to send in terms of uh, flag officers to Cambodia to pay uh, courtesy calls. The Chinese are doing all kinds of military exercises, replacing Australia and the U.S. and so doing with their Golden Dragon. Uh, this was a recent uh, gift of China, um, a, a tractor of some kind. And around the Independence Monument, uh, the Chinese have uh, done exercises to appear as though they were bolstering uh, the, the existing regime of Prime Minister Hun Sen, who has been in power for 34 years. Uh, the Chinese presence in Cambodia, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, has been Tremendous. Uh, the Khmer Rouge period saw that they were, the China and Cambodia, brothers in arms. Uh, you had a wave of investment in garments. Most of the garment sector in Cambodia, which is a huge, huge sector for the country, is greater Chinese owned. Uh, not all of it, of course, Beijing, but we're talking about Singaporean, uh, Malaysian, and, and Hong Kong, Macau, uh, et cetera, Taiwanese. 
Uh, over time, there's been a shift towards energy mining and agriculture and real estate, and much of Cambodia's uh, hydroelectric uh, power expansion to date has been financed by China. Um, at, at some level, you know, all of these dams are really, really a huge factor. Got, these, there's been uh, power outages in the country, and the uh, reasoning is that we need more hydroelectric power, but there are already 17 dams being planned, so how many more can a, can a country sustain of that size? Uh, China's development finance assistance and soft loan focus has been primarily on, up, on, on infrastructure, and it is part of China's going global policy, which has been this idea of the Belt Road and before that the Silk Road and so on. Uh, so one belt, one road. Most of you, I'm sure, are quite familiar with it. A trillion, possibly, dollars in terms of planned investments, which range you know, in all over the world, really, but even to New Zealand, uh, certainly Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, high-speed railways uh, and uh, gas pipelines and so on. And so it's really, it's really fascinating. Now, of course, it's a numbers game. So a trillion dollars, it's not they've dropped a trillion dollars. It means they're prepared, possibly, to go up to that number. Uh, a lot of projects get relabeled Belt Road, even though they were not originally Belt Road. They've, in fact, there are, there are Belt Road projects uh, that are listed in the list of infrastructure projects for Belt Road that, that, that started years before Belt Road was ever begun. So uh, they're just relabeling certain things under the umbrella of Belt Road. Um, and there you have it more geographically uh, placed, but, but really it, this does not encompass the entire plan that China has. In terms of ports, we, we are aware that there are, um, there are a number of ports that China is uh, investing in that have uh, dual use uh, purposes. So in Cambodia, there's a port that I'll talk about in greater detail in a moment that uh, appears to be on a 99 year lease uh, and it has uh, certain features that are very suspicious. Uh, you may, uh, of course, be aware of the Sri Lanka port of Habantota, which uh, has been handed over to China uh, on a private equity swap uh, that uh, uh, Sri Lanka agreed to when it could not repay the loans that China lent the country for that port. Uh, but to give you a picture of the sources of aid for Cambodia, Ch China has been uh, and continues to be a very major player. It, it in fact, uh, exceeded uh, uh, or became the, the largest donor to Cambodia, exceeding Japan's involvement uh, some years ago. And for that, the, the real bottom line, and this I think applies to more than just Cambodia, is that it's a, it's a win, 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 win for China. Uh, you have excess Chinese capital investment. Uh, you have sometimes a no tender or a tender to only Chinese firm process, uh, which tend to be, of course, state uh, connected or state owned. Uh, they, these projects then end up employing Chinese workers, uh, and this is where there could be another win. They're typically men, so you've got a country uh, that has three million too many men compared to women. Maybe they can find a spouse when they do do the work outside of China, uh, which is a personal win for them. Uh, and if things go wrong, I mentioned earlier this debt equity swap situation where uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, a 99-year lease was agreed to. That's the, the time span of Hong Kong handed over to uh, the United Kingdom, uh, I should add. So very symbolic in that sense. And here you have some pictures of that, of that handover with the uh, requisite uh, lottery-looking check that was uh, also printed for some reason for $292 million. Now the message, of course, is that this could be a kind of debt trap diplomacy, uh, uh, debt diplomacy here, President, uh, Vice President Pence talking about how China uses this debt diplomacy to essentially expand its influence. He says today that country is offering hundreds of billions of dollars in infrastructure loans to governments from Asia, uh, to Africa, to Europe, and even Latin America, yet the terms of those loans are opaque at best, and the benefits invariably flow uh, overwhelmingly to Beijing. Just ask Sri Lanka, which took out a, on a massive debt to let Chinese uh, state companies build a port of questionable commercial value. Two years ago, uh, that country could no longer afford those payments, so Beijing pressured Sri Lanka to deliver the new port directly into Chinese hands. It may soon become a Ford military base for China's growing blue water navy. And it isn't, of course, just uh, seaports. It's also uh, possibly airports of dubious commercial value. This is the um, world's emptiest airport, 10,000 square meters and one flight per day, perhaps, uh, one airline coming in, 
very, very uh, dubious in terms of commercial value. Why would they build this? And uh, who's losing money on, on, a, on a proposition like this? When you're loaning money, you're obviously expecting to be paid back. And if you're not paid back, then you get to uh, do a, an equity swap where you own the actual property, at least for a duration. And it's not just bridges, roads, empty airports and ports. It's private investment in high-rise condos, uh, 150 casinos in Cambodia, more than Vegas and Macau combined. I mean, we're talking about uh, a, a, an incredible amount of activity in a small country like Cambodia. And after all, what is this money? Well, why so much money? Well, you know, they're, they're there to make money, certainly. But when you're talking about casinos and buying uh, condos, oftentimes this is about laundering money, which involves taking your ill-gotten gains and converting it in something else or gambling it away. But, but at least in the case of condos, essentially buying real estate so you can have a foothold in another country uh, with uh, some actual real estate value that you can uh, uh, tap into later. And they're not renting them out. It's not, it's not a, I'm buying this to rent out later. They're just leaving them empty. So you've got uh, in Phnom Penh this diamond island, an artificial island created in which um, there are these buildings there. And at night, it's just totally dark. There, there are only a few occupants. All the uh, units are apparently owned, but they're just not occupied at all. <coughs> you can imagine what that does to the real estate prices. Uh, ghost cities aren't just a problem for China. They're becoming a problem for Cambodia as units are snapped up, left empty, uh, which drives up real estate prices. And here I have a quote from Xi Jinping who says, houses are built uh, to be uh, inhabited, not for speculation. I think a lesson that Cambodia ought to listen to as well. Speaking of Xi Jinping thought, um, I think one of the interesting aspects of how the thinking that China exercises now is revealed in a February 2009 commentary uh, he gave in which, uh, I think he was mis visiting Mexico and then he was speaking uh, to Chinese businessmen there. And he said, there are a few foreigners with full bellies who have nothing better to do than try to point their fingers at our country. China does not export revolution, hunger, poverty, nor does China cause you any headaches. Just what else do you want? Uh, so a, I think a narrative that, that will later replay itself in the case of Cambodia, where color revolution is often used as a reason for why uh, uh, Cambodia needs to get away from the West, because the West is promoting color revolution, something that I think the word revolution here uh, is in reference to in terms of causing revolution. Um, in terms of Chinese involvement in Cambodia, it's been soft power, certainly, that uh, notion of influencing through persuasion rather than coercion. Uh, Joe Nye's uh, original definition didn't include actually uh, foreign aid and investment, but you know you can lump all these things together and see that that there's been great, a great deal of influence in terms of soft power in Cambodia. And it can be high aimed at uh, senior officials, elites, and low targeted at, at the broader public. I mean, uh, if you think about uh, Korean K-pop, for example, this is soft power. This is the power to influence people into believing that Korean culture, Korean um, pop songs are, are to be listened to. Uh, one of the biggest schools, Chinese language schools outside of China, is in Cambodia. 15,000 students there uh, studying in Phnom Penh. Uh, not all of them ethnic Chinese. You've got people who essentially want to learn the language in order to be able to be marketable in, the, in, a, mar in a job marketplace that requires uh, frequently uh, Chinese language literacy. Now, uh, this is a cartoon from an old friend of mine who passed away, characterizing what was then what he saw as, his rela as the relationship between China and Cambodia, a rather, rather uh, uh, shall we say, salty image. Um, uh, and in terms of actual gifts, well, China has been on a, on a tear in, uh, in giving things to Cambodia. In 1999, the uh, Senate was built for uh, Cambodia. It was, uh, it was the, the outcome of a, of a political sort of uh, resolution in which uh, the understanding was how do we, you know, how do we fit all these politicians that, that can't be fit anymore into the political system? We'll create a Senate. And the Chinese built for Cambodia the, these, uh, the Senate complex. And a decade later, as if with clockwork like precision, they build this Council of Ministers building for Cambodia. But it, it has what you can see there in the middle, a kind of uh, uh, pyramid like, uh, tomb like uh, uh, structure, which was supposed to be where the Prime Minister of Cambodia would have his office. But then he came up with some excuse about how 
you know, this was not feng shui or something, and then he built another building next door to it for himself, which the Chinese, of course, also helped build. But, but it's fascinating. And, of course, the speculation was how many listening devices are there in this building that the Chinese have built for the Cambodians uh, uh, baked into the wall so that they can uh, know everything that goes on. Um, and, and I should say, frequently, all this infrastructure is done at a breakneck speed uh, with literally 24 hours a day construction through many shifts, multiple shifts of workers, of course, who are all Chinese. Uh, now, what has Cambodia done for China? In 2009, December, there were about 20 plus Uyghurs who tried to seek asylum, not in Cambodia, but to try to, they had reached Cambodia and were trying to get out of Cambodia to a third country, uh, having escaped uh, Xinjiang, China. Um, Cambodia sort of played along and said, okay, yes, yes, we'll, We'll, we'll look at their uh, claims. Uh, they were allowed to meet with UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, but uh, interestingly, the, the, the day before Xi Jinping, who was then vice president, came to Cambodia to sign what amounted to $1.2 billion of deals, uh, they were shipped off, the Uyghurs were shipped off on a uh, private charter back to China and have never been heard from again. Uh, so it is really, it, it, it appeared as though the Cambodians, the, the elites there had played the game of we'll talk to you, and then, well, you know, actually, uh, Xi Jinping is coming, and we need to hand over these Uyghurs, uh, and they did so the day before. And as punishment, <coughs> what happened then was that uh, there would be consequences. The U.S., which had promised uh, 200 trucks for Cambodia, canceled uh, that, uh, that donation, and the reaction from the Cambodian government, uh, heard the spokesperson says, if the U.S. gives us the equipment, we are happy, and if they won't give it to us, it is also good. So uh, clearly a kind of, we don't care. Uh, and of course the, the Chinese then gave Cambodia a bunch of trucks and uh, 50,000 uniforms as a kind of, you know, thanks for your loyalty uh, gift. Um, China and Southeast Asia, you can see the, the reason for this influence. I mean, you've got Southeast Asia is China's uh, nearest uh, neighborhood. I mean, if you were thinking about Monroe Doctrine, you know, where Latin America, is our domain, uh, this would be China's domain. Uh, the Chinese model could be disastrous for a region uh, of nascent democracies, that's certainly the case, uh, and weak civil society. China appears to be using its soft power to incrementally push out Japan, Taiwan, and even the US out of uh, regional influence. And you can see that across uh, the South China Sea in which uh, China used essentially uh, ASEAN's inability to come to de a decision because of its consensus-driven uh, policy, everybody has to agree, to essentially force um, uh, a non-agreement. Uh, frequently, the, the image of China versus ASEAN solidarity is this. You have uh, China as the gang of one and ASEAN with its uh, 10 members unable really to pretend to be one. Um, the, you only need one member of ASEAN to essentially block, uh, block decisions by ASEAN. So it's, it's, re it's a real challenge, this ASEAN way of doing business. When you see how leaders in 2012 met, uh, that was, that was uh, the first indication. They could not pass a uh, joint resolution at the end of their meeting, something that hadn't happened in 40 years. Frequently, it's really more like this when they meet. And uh, sometimes it can even come to blows when it comes to decisions uh, or uh, disagreements between, say, Cambodia and Thailand over Prasahia Temple. Uh, and, there, and I think part of the argument has been that uh, Cambodia's anger towards ASEAN stems from the fact that it didn't get any backup when it was in a dispute with, with Thailand, and so it feels like it has no loyalty as, as a result to ASEAN. Um, but to, just to get you into the, the depth of things a little bit, the July of, of 2012, ASEAN could not reach a consensus on, on handling disputes in the South China Sea, and it rejected a compromise on the wording of a joint communique. That was Cambodia's really action as chair of ASEAN during that meeting in taking its prerogative of chair as well as one of 10 members where you have to all agree, and Cambodia refused. And the then Minister of Foreign Affairs for Indonesia said, this is very strange territory for me. It's, it's very disappointing that at this 12th, uh, it's this 11th hour, ASEAN is not able to rally around a certain common language on the South China Sea. We've gone through so many problems in the past, but we've never failed to act as one. It happened again in November 2012 when uh, the Cambodian government spokesperson, uh, an old friend of mine, as it happened, said, 
that ASEAN Southeast Asian leaders had decided not to internationalize the South China Sea from now on, which was language straight out of the Chinese spokesperson's playbook. We oppose the internationalization of, South Ch of the South China Sea, which meant, of course, we don't want other countries involved. Let's deal with this bilaterally in terms of you know, the Philippines and China, in terms of uh, Malaysia and China, the, 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 the claimants to the uh, South China Sea. And that's, that's certainly a way w uh, of, of dealing with it, but it, it, it wouldn't help countries that need more backup. Um, and it, it implies really that the Chinese have bought a seat at the ASEAN table, courtesy of Cambodia. They had by then uh, given, or by now at least, $4.3 billion in loans from China, 20% uh, of Cambodia's GDP, uh, given a uh, total of about 32 percent uh, of GDP uh, held as, as public debt. So, you know, possibly two-thirds of Cambodia's debt held by China. When you have all of your eggs in one basket, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to not break those eggs. And, or to use the African proverb, if your hand is in another man's pocket, you better walk where he walks. Uh, and that is what I think is happening with, with Cambodia in 2016. Uh, Cambodia, with possibly Laos Bloc's dimension of the permanent court of arbitration ruling that favored the Philippines on, this, uh, on the South China Sea, uh, and as a result, it didn't get mentioned in the communique that passed. Uh, and it's not just China calling the shots. Cambodia is also making its own threats, but perhaps learning from China, uh, where the prime minister has uh, said that he could arrest anyone uh, on Facebook who uh, insulted him. Uh, within Cambodia's borders. So uh, here's one case in point. Uh, this gentleman here, Samuel Ta, 29 years old, uh, wrote on Facebook that the Cambodian government was authoritarian and uh, then was promptly arrested. Uh, so that would be irony defined, uh, I would say, you know, call somebody authoritarian and arrest them. Uh, that, that uh, unfortunately, he's, I think, still trying to battle all of that. Uh, and then in, in March of last year, there was an ASEAN-Australia special summit that took place in Australia. The, uh, there were some Cambodian Australians who were protesting uh, Hun Sen, Prime Minister Hun Sen, and he, he said that he would send people to go beat them up. Um, and so as a result, you know, there, was, there was really a, a great consternation in terms of like, can, can, a, can a leader really say something like that? I mean, how, how much are we willing to to accept, and he he had he really was very angry. He wanted he wanted Australia to punish these protesters, not understanding, of course, that Australia is not going to do that. Uh, but he understood that th with the ASEAN way, it w he could cause damage to ASEAN. So he said at one point before the meeting, ASEAN without Hun Sen is not ASEAN. I'll just give a, the reason that I'm busy with the the, the election, which was taking place that year. Hun Sen can veto, he likes to speak in the third person, can veto a joint statement between ASEAN and Australia. If you do something improper, Cambodia alone can make the statement get stuck. I would like to send a message in advance that if Cambodia does not agree, it means the statement will be impossible. And I think it really points to this uh, Achilles tendon with ASEAN. Uh, there was a Singapore commentator who, after seeing this, uh, remarked that really it's, it's fascinating. You have a situation in which you know, ASEAN is not supposed to interfere in its member countries' politics, right? Domestic politics are off limits. But domestic politics in a country should not interfere also with ASEAN's functioning. And this is where things are going crazy, where, you know, you have problems, Hun Sen has problems with his own domestic politics, and then he brings these problems to ASEAN and causes ASEAN to have problems as a result. So, you know, it should go both ways. Uh, of course, China's law jest, uh, goes beyond ASEAN and Southeast, uh, uh, beyond ASEAN in Southeast Asia. I used to work in East Timor uh, as part of uh, the UN development program there. Uh, I mean, Timor is one of the world's newest countries. You have half of an island uh, uh, that used to be part of Indonesia, and the Chinese embassy is active there. This is the U.S. embassy. I used to play tennis right over here in these courts here, and the Chinese have built. Uh, these, uh, the, the foreign ministry building for the Timorese. So th this is, again, their way of, show of giving these, these sort of symbolic gifts of buildings. And so uh, a few years later, they also did, this is the, the final version of the, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They also did the, 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 the presidential palace for the Timorese president. And the interest, of course, is that there's a Timor gap there. There are energy 
uh, uh, there's, there's, there's gas, there's uh, mining, uh, and of course there's, there's, uh, there's very deep waters that would allow submarines to travel undetected in that area. Uh, democracy globally, I would argue, is in, uh, is in retreat. There are very serious problems uh, currently. In Cambodia, the opposition's been dissolved. Uh, leaders uh, dissolved, not of their own making, but it was uh, the Supreme Court of Cambodia under, under the control of the Prime Minister ordered its dissolution. The leaders were jailed and exiled. Thailand, Cambodia, and other countries have turned Facebook uh, posts into uh, arrests. Um, the Philippines, you've got a president, says he killed somebody as a teenager, and not sure if he did or not, the spokesperson says. Uh, Thailand, six attempts really to hold an election, but uh, an opposition party that is dissolved prior to the election, and another leader who is now accused of sedi sedition uh, being brought to a police station. Uh, is this the result at all of Chinese uh, Belt Road Initiative financing that would uh, seem to indicate a desire for certain political outcomes. I, I'm not sure, okay? There's, there's not a smoking gun, per se, in terms of, like, we give you this money, you won't be a democracy. Uh, but there is certainly something going on in China itself, where uh, the leader there has removed term limits, so Xi Jinping forever, perhaps, uh, or uh, a very, very uh, uh, thin skin when it comes to criticism or even comparison of Xi Jinping as Winnie the Pooh. Uh, being uh, censored. So uh, there, such images not allowed, uh, and I'm sure you heard about, maybe you heard it because my kids watch Peppa Pig all the time. So, you know, Peppa Pig being banned because it's promoting gangster life, um, uh, which is remarkable because I certainly didn't think of Peppa Pig that way. Uh, but, you know, as for Cambodia, you have a, a, a country that is becoming increasingly a province of China and it's in, its, uh, in the way in which it, it operates, a wholly owned subsidiary. I'm not an alarmist, but something's different about this particular relationship. And you can see that in, um, in a uh, little excerpt uh, for uh, the recent world threat uh, assessment that was worldwide threat assessment that, that um, Dan Coates, uh, chairman of the uh, 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 National Intelligence uh, put out. Uh, so there's a quote here, Cambodia's slide towards autocracy, which culminated in the Cambodian People's Party retention of power and complete dominance of the national legislature opens the way for a constitutional amendment that could lead a to a Chinese military presence in the country. Uh, so that, there you go. There, there's there's uh, a line there that is singling out Cambodia for possible sort of uh, uh, increased uh, dominion by China, and uh, you know, new stories, of course, that, that highlight this. So is Cambodia's Kaftong project uh, for Chinese tourists or China's military, uh, a tourism development by the Chinese firm uh, Union Development Group looks too good to be true, skeptics say it is, and that its suspiciously long airport runway and deep water port will give China a military uh, foothold in the country, and you can see here is, uh, uh, there's um, an argument that the runway being built is, is far too long for your normal uh, needs. So you've got a 3,400 meter runway. Uh, it's longer than the uh, longest runway at Phnom Penh International Airport, which has most of the traffic in the country. And you could argue that, okay, well, okay, it's Boeing 747, the FAA recommends 2,800 meters. So why do you need 3,400 meters? Well, maybe you need it to accommodate Chinese planes. Um, uh, and the reactions have been <laughs> really quite interesting. I, I love reading these comments from the story. So this was in that South China Morning Post story. And so I look at these, look at these uh, comments, and I don't know, it's probably too small for you to read, but you know, the first one is, China wants to build, wants a military foothold in Cambodia to support operations in the South China Sea. The runway near the beach is longer than the main airport in Penh. Why? Don't they lengthen the uh, Phnom Penh Airport runway? What is the port for? Large cruise ships? Is there a tourist town there? No conclusion built for China's military purposes. Uh, but you've got the defenders as well. You've got, you know, first of all, international wide body flights, which is most likely the case here, which carry substantial amounts of fuel and are therefore heavier, may also have landing requirements of 3,048 meters or more and takeoff requirements of 3,962 meters. Second of all, and most importantly, even if it is for military purposes, it is Cambodia's decision. Um, or anyone forgetting that the 747 needs a 3,050 meter runway? 
they're retiring, but there are still many of them as cargo flights. The longer the runway, the safer and flexible it is. If it is possible to build a longer runway, why not? And finally, I love this one. If Hansen is involved, anything is possible. He is the king of the kickbacks. So <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, it, you, you, get, you get the picture. I mean, these, these comments, of course, are just p possibly uh, trolls working uh, different sides of the game and making comments just for their own sake. But I, sir, I was quoted in an earlier story in which you know, I said the Chinese are, see commercial ports as a foot in the door for their navy. Anyway, any deep water commercial port can be used for naval ships, so the dual purpose is always there. Again, reminder of what Pre uh, Vice President Pence said earlier about debt uh, diplomacy. Uh, so the uh, Prime Minister of Cambodia here, Hun Sen, shaking hands with Xi Jinping, uh, and promoting in Cambodia this book of Xi Jinping's gov you know, governance of China, which, which is really this idea of you know, Xi Jinping thought in a book, and it's been translated into Khmer to be distributed and shared among Cambodian elites. Um, the late Sok An, who was uh, Hun Sen's guru, promoting uh, an English language version of the book here. And, uh, and you know, it's not read and little, but it, you know, it reminds certainly of, of, of an earlier time when, when, uh, when the promotion of, of uh, Mao Zedong thought was certainly uh, out there. Um, and it's, it's a different time for China. I, I don't know if some of you remember this incident. It was, I think, uh, last year around this time, there was a, uh, it was a press conference in which there was a question about uh, Belt Road and you know financing and so on. And so you don't need to read the question. It's a very long question that the woman in red asked, and then the woman in blue just rolls her eyes uh, at the question because it, it's for her ridiculous, uh, uh, because it's sycophantic and just gets into this. You know, we've we've scripted this question for you so that you can ask this question. And even the person answering it took less time answering it than the person asking the question took for asking the, the, the actual question. But, but anyway, she gets in trouble, of course, for doing this, that, that eye roll as a result, loses her job, and uh, other terrible things happen to her for that. Um, but, you know, you have uh, more visits from uh, Chinese dignitaries to uh, Cambodia or from uh, the Prime Minister of Cambodia to China. Um, that hug there, at least he didn't go for this with uh, Prayut Ochoa which was rather, rather embarrassing. Uh, but that is something that often happens, unfortunately, in, these, uh, in this situation. We may think there's never too much information, but you also get way too much information now with radical transparency in Cambodia in terms of, of Twitter use and the ability to share things that are happening with the prime minister and his gastrointestinal problems the previous night. Um, but that is now the situation in Cambodia where sometimes there really is too much information. So, Cambodian democracy has been gutted, I would argue, uh, over the last two years. I don't, I don't really care if, if the argument is there was never democracy to begin with. I mean, you could say that. Those who say, there's nothing destroyed. It was never there. Uh, nothing was destroyed. So, uh, of this, I am certain Cambodians are less free to speak today than they were a year ago, uh, two years ago even, or perhaps even a decade ago, or maybe even two decades ago. Uh, some of this is, I think, the result of a, a kind of revisionist history in which the authorities are taking over now, their, their, their messaging has changed what has happened in Cambodia. Um, and the truth of what has happened in Cambodia is that uh, Cambodia's heroes have been uh, killed. Uh, labor leader Chia uh was assassinated, Chut Ruti, an environmentalist, uh, env environmental activist was killed, political co uh, commentator Kem Lay was uh, also shot dead. Uh, it is, I think, what the reality is, and, and the Cambodians have a term for this. Um, they call it bas bat, which means broken courage. What the authorities have done is to essentially kill Cambodia's heroes in order to break the courage of Cambodians from rising up. A and what they want to replace it with is this idea of sovereignty and let us solve our problems ourselves. So, so um, this was at a World Economic Forum meeting where Prime Minister Hun Sen said, countries which are outside of the region always slap our heads and tell us what to do. I raise this issue not as a message for, my, uh, for any particular country, but I would like to say that these Mekong countries are the political victims, so I request outsiders from the region who don't know about the issues to let us solve our problems ourselves. And then he goes into Myanmar, of course, digging a hole there, uh, saying you know, they, they should resolve their own problems and not, and not have others telling them what to do. And that, of course, 
is self-serving because he wants outsiders not to talk about Cambodia and whatever goes on there. Um, and what goes on there is this. The opposition leader is exiled. Um, his uh, replacement was jailed for a year and is now under house arrest. Uh, deputy is exiled. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs puts out this white paper called To Tell the Truth in which it revises all the recent history of Cambodia, revisionist history of Cambodia, and promotes this notion of color revolution. This is what's been happening in Cambodia. We have been victims of color revolution uh, from the West. The National Democratic Institute is expelled from Cambodia. Radio Free Asia is shuttered from Cambodia, still broadcasting out of Thailand into Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia is uh, one of two main language newspapers is shuttered, English language newspapers. Um, and the other one is sold to a Malaysian businessman who was a public relations guru for the prime minister and then now has been transferred to a um, Cambodian who is part of the elite and of course sides with the prime minister. So it's ba basically been captured as a result, this uh, the Trump and Post. And of course, the, um, uh, the National Assembly of Cambodia, which is con now, of course, completely controlled by the Cambodian People's Party, the Prime Minister's Party, votes to then reallocate uh, all the seats to other parties that didn't win anything or won 3% of the vote. That was pre-2018. And then, of course, in the 2018 election, when they dissolve the main opposition party, they, uh, the ruling party wins all the seats uh, and just takes over everything. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Kem Lay assassinated there. He's in the middle, uh, s not long after this interview takes place. Meanwhile, the political elites in Cambodia are f documented to, to be uh, very well-to-do, very well-to-do. I mean, uh, they're, they're gatekeepers to essentially all of the things that come into Cambodia and all of the things that leave Cambodia. They get to be toll booth takers of, uh, of bribes and ownership of companies, joint ventures that essentially do business in Cambodia. And the, you know, the results are horrific in that uh, Kem Lay was talking about that report, the Global Witness Report that I mentioned earlier, and he was killed. And of course, the reaction from the authorities seems to be, let's put together a white paper about this. And, and that is uh, the result of this 132-pager um, that talks about color revolution as the, uh, the outcome uh, of, uh, of what the West wants of Cambodia. So, so if, if, if China doesn't want democracy, the West wants democracy, or the West wants color revolution, which is their code word for regime change. Um, in that report, the Prime Minister says in the preamble, uh, this, this gem of a quote here that I, I reproduce, real democracy in Cambodia has not been set back or fallen. Instead, it has been um, protected and strengthened in accordance with the principle of the rule of law for the great benefit of the people and nation. Only fake democracy has been abolished. And that really is the thought that I want to leave you with, aside from one here uh, in which uh, Hun Sen kicks the soccer ball rather well. Uh, we're now beyond the World Cup, I realize, uh, but they remind me, those words certainly remind me of that one time when he did a hole-in-one uh, with the soccer ball. Anyhow, I think I've had my 45 minutes just about. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to take your questions. So, yes, questions.